Some people say this is the California of Canada, the gateway to the Orient, Lotus Land. But here, it is known quite simply as Vancouver. No, no, the Lion's Gate is just not enough. Oh, I know. What did you do on the weekend? Not much. Worked in the garden a bit. Pumpkins are really coming along beautifully. Oh. How about you? I went to a fabulous early ski sale. Seventeen forty five. The northwest coast of North America has never been explored by a white man. It is almost inaccessible. The land is rugged and windswept, and it can be quite inhospitable. Nevertheless, in this era of exploration, this new land is a focus of much attention in Europe. The British government offers twenty thousand pounds to the first navigator to discover a new trade route to the Orient through the elusive Northwest Passage of North America. The King of Spain, anxious to protect his interests in the Americas, also commands his ships to explore the coast in search of the passage. In the enlightened salons of French nobility, however, they only talk passionately about the return to nature and Rousseau's primitive man. On April 1st, 1791, Captain George Vancouver sails from England to join the search for this new route to the Orient. At five in the morning of Wednesday, June the 13th, we again directed our course to the eastern shore. We landed at about noon on a low bluff point, which I distinguished by the name of Point Grey. From there, we proceeded first up the eastern branch of the Sound. We met about 50 Indians in their canoes. They conducted themselves with the greatest decorum and civility, presenting us with several cooked fish. I distinguished this channel by the name of Barad's Channel, and we retraced our passage in. As we were rowing for Point Grey, we discovered at anchor a brig and a schooner wearing the colors of Spanish vessels of war. Their captains informed me that this inlet had in the preceding year been partly surveyed by some Spanish officers whose chart they produced. I cannot avoid acknowledging that I experienced no small degree of mortification in finding that the gulf had already been examined. I'm sure it's three blocks. It's another three blocks. Oh, I wish people wouldn't use umbrellas. I know I'm going to lose an eye sooner or later. Well, they don't know how to use them, do they? I mean, you think since Vancouver people are born with one in each hand, they should know how to use them. Yeah. Ow. I can get along with that. What's a little water? <laughs> and a little more water and a little more water. Oh, I wish those that. cars would be careful. I'm drenched. Some people think that all we do in Vancouver is talk about the weather rain because we get so much of it, and good weather because it's such a novelty. Then, of course, we hear that no one really works here because this is Canada's playground. You know, life is one big holiday. On Friday afternoons, you go out in your boat, if you're lucky enough to have one. Failing that, you can start your weekend early with a long walk along the Stanley Park seawall. The fact is that Vancouver is 5,000 kilometers away from Toronto and Ottawa, separated by high mountains. Maybe that's why some people don't see us all that clearly. 
Because Vancouver is, after all, Canada's trade and communication center on the West Coast. A city of almost a million people looking towards the Orient with one of the busiest ports in North America. Visitors to Vancouver always seem to end up in Gastown. They're attracted by the many stores and restaurants, and of course, by the history of the place. It is here that the city had its beginnings in 1867. While Canada celebrated the birth of Confederation, a man named Jack Dayton arrived at the site of Gastown by canoe, with his Indian woman, his belongings, a barrel of whiskey, and six dollars in his pocket. Yes, sir, people around here call me Joe. But I knew Jack Dayton quite well. As a matter of fact, we used to call him Gassy Jack. Because once you got him talking, you could never shut him up. I remember when he landed down at the mill at the place the Indians called Luck Lucky. Well, all the men came by to see what was up, and he cracked open a whiskey barrel. He said, gather around, boys, have a drink on Jack Dayton. I haven't got much money. But I want to start a little business, and I need your assistance. I want to open a saloon. <laughs> That's all it took. Everybody pitched in, and the next day, he had his 12-foot by 20-foot shack, and he called it the Globe Saloon. When it was done, he pulled himself up onto the roof. He thanked everybody, and he said, this represents the best, the blood and guts of England. So. The Globe was our first saloon. And Gassy Jack ruled it with a firm hand. Every night, he turned out the lights and the customers at 10.30. Go on, get out of here. You men have to work tomorrow, he used to say. He knew they'd be back the next day. Yeah, Jack Dayton. He was quite a guy. With business booming at the Globe, Gassy Jack built a hotel which he proudly called Dayton House. British Columbia finally agreed to join Confederation, but not until Ottawa promised to build a transcontinental railway through the Rockies. The West Coast lumber business was booming, and Gastown got a new name, Granville. Ten years later, it was renamed Vancouver. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Nora Birkenhead was only a few months old when Vancouver was born in 1886. The world's first automobile was up and sputtering. Coca-Cola was on its way to becoming the real thing. The Statue of Liberty was arriving in America. And Vancouver was getting ready for its first city council. <laughs> yes, sir. I remember that first council meeting. May the 10th, 1886. Now, I went along to see how they'd make out. The building was already the courthouse and the jail. So when they discovered they, they didn't have enough chairs for the new council, they took some from the prisoners' cells. <laughs> if you can believe that. Only one of the ten men on the council had any experience. And when uh, old, old Mayor McLean, he called the meeting to order, they realized they had no paper, no pen, and no ink. So one of them had to go out and buy some. <laughs> well, of course, then they got down to serious business, and they talked about hiring Vancouver's first employees. But then someone pointed out that the city had no money to pay them. No, not even a bank account. <laughs> so, so right there and then, they, they created an instant treasury. Uh, you know, with the fines paid by the drunks and troublemakers arrested during the election celebrations. <laughs> that was our first city council. <laughs> In the spring of 1886, the city's future looked bright. 
But a month later, a lot of dreams went up in flames during the Great Fire. In 20 minutes, the city was wiped off the face of the earth. But 12 hours later, it was rising from the ashes. On May 23rd, 1887, Vancouver was on its feet again for the historic arrival of the first Canadian Pacific train from Montreal. A few days later, a large ship arrived from Yokohama to unload bales of silk and tea. The waiting express train steamed out immediately for Montreal, New York, and London. The dream of a trade route between the Orient and Europe was at last becoming a reality. Ships arriving from the Orient still bring the smell of spice and a sense of adventure. But instead of silk and tea, they carry cars and electronics bound for Canadian markets. They sail home with their holes full of Canada's raw materials. From the prairies, grain to help feed the world, sulfur for industry, and potash for fertilizer. From British Columbia, coal and minerals. British Columbia's vast forests provide more jobs than any industry at a time of concern for high unemployment in the city and the province. A growing percentage of our forest products are shipped to American and Pacific Rim customers. For local fishermen, a catch of Pacific salmon is still the best in the world. The commercial fishing industry, however, has been going through some rough waters, but has maintained its strong, traditional presence. Today, Vancouver has one of the busiest ports in North America. This enormous seagoing traffic is the key to the city's economic vitality. Many people say Vancouver is the most beautiful city in the world. That's because we're surrounded by nature at her best. But this has created an ongoing dilemma for the people of Vancouver, a conflict between their love of nature and their desire for industrial progress. In fact, for years, Vancouver has exported this concern for nature with homegrown ecological groups like Greenpeace, now famous or infamous around the world. They came in their thousands, people old, young, and in between. They were professional people, trade unionists, students, politicians, and the clergy. They were the unemployed and the disabled. They were the rich and they were the poor. In short, an example of a community on the march for peace. Canada's third largest city is now a nuclear-free zone by order of City Council and Mayor Mike Harcourt. Welcome to a nuclear weapons-free zone. I'd also like to welcome you to the peace capital of North America, Vancouver.
We could be a thousand miles away from civilization. In reality, we're in a thousand acre park in the heart of the city. Stanley Park is a sanctuary, a retreat for nature lovers. Save their sawmills. You got that right. Oh, you're crazy. Did you get in on that gold plank? Did I? <laughs> I couldn't get my hands on enough. I mean, the market was wild today. Recently, there has been an attempt to begin to enjoy the city for itself, aside from the setting. The people of Vancouver really seem to enjoy their downtown more and more, and architect Arthur Erickson has helped to kindle the fire of this newfound romance. I guess you have to compare a city to a person. There isn't a perfect person, there isn't a perfect city. Each has its charms, each has its drawbacks, and uh, that's the reality of a, of a city. I think for a city to be successful, I think the first thing is everybody that's there has to enjoy it and have a certain enthusiasm about the city. And, and, and more than that, I think they have to love their city. Vancouverites can never really get away from the overwhelming beauty of their surroundings. In the art gallery, much of the local work reflects an ongoing fascination with the mysteries of nature. From the past, Emily Carr, with her dark, brooding paintings of the rainforest. In the present, Gathy Falk, with images of a nature that's been tamed and tempered by the city. The 
one man-made place that Vancouverites really enjoy is Granville Island. It's become the town square. Who could have guessed that Granville Island would become so popular? It was reclaimed from industrial land that no one wanted to see. Now, any day you head down to the island, you're likely to run into your friends doing exactly what you're doing. With its markets, its art galleries, and craft stores, Granville Island has now become, for Vancouverites, a favorite place to explore. Kate, did you see, did you see Chris Gaze in that last show at the Arts Club? Was he fantastic or what? I mean, he was a very, very funny actor. I, yeah, I heard. I didn't see it. Um, it, was, it was brilliant. I couldn't get comps. Really <laughs> But they're doing some really, really good work. Yeah. in False Creek has a dreamy quality about it. And in a sense, it really is a dream come true for politicians and builders. Factories once belch smoke into the air. Trendy condos for the well-to-do rub elbows with equally fashionable co-ops for working people with families. The only problem, of course, is to find a place here. The ultimate fantasy of Vancouver sports fans, to cheer on the champs without fear of rain, came true with the inflatable dome stadium at BC Place. You'd be hard pressed to find even a non-sports fan who doesn't like this big soft addition to the skyline. Someone described it as a giant marshmallow that fell from the sky. Surrounded by Granville Island and the dome, the parks and the condos, and the site of Expo 86, False Creek, has become the new heart of the city. If a city has a personality, then it must be formed by its people. In that sense, Vancouver has many faces. Its people have come to live here from all over the world. Because most Vancouverites have chosen to live here, they really enjoy their city. And they've developed a certain level of tolerance for people who've come here from other places. British Columbia's native Indians were very tolerant of newcomers. That's one of the reasons they were swamped by so many immigrants from all over the world. Today, Indian people are fighting to restate their aboriginal claims to the land. 
because in many ways, their land is their culture. And they're relearning their language and customs after generations of living in the overwhelming shadow of white culture. The first visitors greeted by the Indians on the Pacific coast were Europeans. And in the West End, where tall evergreen forests have been replaced by high-rises, there is still a heart of Europe in downtown Vancouver. of European immigrants settled on the West Coast. They brought along their traditions and values. Times were not always easy, but the various communities grew together and created their own neighborhoods. <laughs> New Canadians from the other side of the Pacific found it tougher to put down roots and create the communities that now play such a big part in Vancouver's cultural life. Early morning in Queen Elizabeth Park on top of Little Mountain. Tai Chi, a slow dance form of martial arts, a different way of physical conditioning. Learning Tai Chi is one way to develop an intimate understanding of Vancouver's Chinese community. Visiting Chinatown and its many restaurants is an easier way. A dragon dances down Pender Street, its tail sweeping good fortune over the sea of people to celebrate the opening of a new store. More than a hundred years after its beginnings, as a ghetto for coolies brought in to work on the railways, Vancouver's Chinatown is thriving. It is downtown to many of Vancouver's Chinese. And with dozens of stores and fresh food markets, it's also very popular with other Vancouverites. Vancouver's Chinatown is North America's third largest, after New York and San Francisco. Toby Gardens at the University of British Columbia. A place for reflection and meditation. A traditional reminder of Vancouver's Japanese heritage.
In downtown Vancouver, ancient Japanese traditions are celebrated every summer at the Powell Street Festival. Offerings for a good harvest are placed in front of a Shinto shrine. Of course, what is a festival without food? And here we see that even Japanese ingenuity is an ancient tradition. The priests call the Shinto god soul into the shrine or omikoshi. In popular celebrations like this throughout Japan, they carry the shrine from house to house to chase away evil spirits and to bring prosperity. This is a special day for Arjinder Singh Bansal. If he were in India, he might have arrived on a white horse. Friends and family have gathered together for a very happy occasion. Arjinder is getting married. <laughs> The two families exchange gifts and money before entering the temple. is a traditional Sikh wedding. The groom's family has played a big part in choosing the bride, Manjit Ka. The red scarf is the symbol of their union. After going four times around the altar and the holy scriptures, they will be married according to Sikh tradition. in South Vancouver is very much a Sikh community where people get together to play and talk and shop at home. Vancouver's racial minorities have not always been comfortable here. Turmoil over jobs boiled over into full-blown race riots in 1907 when mobs of whites attacked both the Chinese and Japanese communities. In the spring of 1914, 
the Komagata Maru incident saw a boatload of Indian would-be immigrants refused entry, forced to stay in Vancouver Harbor for nine weeks before they turned around and departed. Then again, during World War II, Japanese Canadians were stripped of their rights and put into internment camps. For some people, that wrong can never be redressed. But today, Vancouver is a port of entry for new Canadian citizens from all over the world. And in the schools, it's even become popular to have the kids take French immersion as well as English. drop into Vancouver from all directions. Well, some will do almost anything to get here. People who've lived in Vancouver seem to miss it forever. Well, I think that this, the whole sensual pleasures of Vancouver, the, that's what, when I come back to Vancouver, I long for, the hearing the ocean and smelling the rich earth, and the air is always clean, and, and just uh, the, even the dampness, you miss it when you're away because there's a moisture, there's a softness about the air. People here say they love the rain, but it's the sunshine that makes them want to live here. Summer is the reward you get for living in Vancouver. It's so beautiful that people simply move outdoors. But there's a price to pay, even for the reward. A day in the life of Vancouver can be very exhausting because there's so much fun to be had. Making yourself beautiful to fit into this real life fantasy land is almost a duty a ritual that becomes an obsession, a call that must be answered. can also be a pretext to party. It's not unusual to see dozens of dance skins celebrating the summer at English Bay. This is not fitness just for the sake of health. 
This is yuppie fitness. The point is to be seen, and sometimes to be seen as much as possible. You know, it's like God has been replaced by, by fitness. You know, you, you can either go to church on Sundays or you'll go to, you know, pump iron four times a week. Yeah. You, you'll put a lot more both. dedicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think on a spiritual level that people are getting more in touch with that side of themselves. They're not looking to the church for that. They're doing it themselves. I think that's but that's true. all people are doing. You know, me, I'm going to improve my body, my mind, my conscience. Well, what's what's wrong with that? What else is there? the fresh air and sunshine of a summer day do have a way of leading to romance. Where else do you find people advertising their love outdoors? By the way, it worked. They did get married. Even as day settles into night and people start to look for a change of pace, Vancouverites still like to stay outside whenever they can. Lucky ones get invited to rooftop cocktail parties in the yuppie condos with the million dollar view of False Creek and the city. Becoming my own person. I mean, who else's person are you planning on being? Yeah, I think that maybe the primal scream sort of thing. Yeah. Or primal sneeze is perhaps primal something sneeze. they should bring into it. Are these very long words? You know Heather? Uh, she's a teacher, right? Was a teacher. What do you mean? This is a <laughs> This is hot. This is hot. I think there's something there. If only to stop your feet from hurting. For some traditional families, long summer days are the only excuse they need to get together for a picnic with grandma and the kids. Others, it's the ideal time to relive past memories and keep the old ways alive. For some, the best way to win the day is square dancing at Stanley Park, where they've been swinging their partners for generations. theater under the stars in Stanley Park is an excuse to stay outside a little longer. And damn the mosquitoes. We're going to Malkin Bowl to see damn Yankees. Well, not for everyone. Some like to linger over dinner out on the dock on Granville Island, between the bridges, where the burning question is, are we dreaming or is this reality? <laughs> I once heard somebody describe Vancouver that, that when God created North America, mm -hmm. he picked it up at the East Coast and all the loot bits rolled to the <laughs> West.
Well, with all that Vancouver has to offer, it's been hard to keep the secret from the rest of the world. As early as 1891, the elite were making the trek to the west coast to sample the city's delights. After a day of shooting ducks, the divine Sarah Bernhardt said of this rain-soaked town, small, yes, but it has people, and that means growth, doesn't it? When King George VI toured the city in 1939, he proclaimed simply, Vancouver is the place to live. In 1951, the king's daughter, Princess Elizabeth, foresaw the city's future when she said, today my eyes and thoughts turn westward across the Pacific to the Orient. And when the lads from Liverpool, the Beatles, blew into town singing, we love you, yay, 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 they caused a riot. But these are the thoughts of visitors. Some Canadians seem to see us differently. You're, f you're full of doubts uh, about the future and about just um, worse than that. You're terribly unaware of what's happening in this country. And, and <laughs> terribly unaware. You know, very often, very often, those who live at the foot of great mountains are the last ones to climb those mountains just because they're there. We're going to be Canada's front door onto the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we have been known as the last stop on the CPR, the back door of Canada. That's the first century of this city. The second century is the front door.